I'm I'm in seven. stimulate conversation and, and for us to really talk about where, where we come from. So to start with, you probably know, but if you don't, if you're new to the congregation, that I ran for uh, State House of Representatives in the 2016 election. I did not win that election, um, but there were a number of things that I learned. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. After the election was over, we counted the votes and where the, I had lost the election at a gathering of a few volunteers, including Pat Lance, who has served as our representative in the 26th district for four or five terms, and was a very effective legislator. She, she volunteered a bit on, on uh, my campaign, drove me around one day when I was out on some really rural areas, and it was a you know, long walk from here to there, and so you don't walk with the dragon. And so Pat was sitting there with me, and uh, you know, just a few days after the election, and she said, I just can't understand why you're not more upset. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, the first time that I ran for office, I was devastated. I said, well, tell me about that. She said, well, I, I ran for, I think it was Pierce County Court Commission. I said, well, how, how old were you? It was like mid-40s or something like that. I said, no. Well, at the time that this election occurred, I was 64. I said, you know, at 64, I kind of know who I am. And being elected or not elected doesn't define me. So, you know, am I disappointed that I lost? Yes. Am I crushed? No. Uh, life goes on. The selection is made and we move on from there. But there were some other lessons that I learned. And I wanted to share a few of those with you before we get started. First of all, I knew this, but I didn't understand it until I did it. That running for office is really difficult. It's a tough job. Uh, a lot of the time, I, I campaigned for about a year. I was recruited in September. I took some time to say yes when I finally did. Uh, then I filed because as soon as you begin doing anything that has to do with campaigning, you're required by law to file with the state of Washington. So I did that. That allows you to start doing some fundraising and so forth. 
But I tell you what, running for an office like the state house, unlike some of the bigger offices, is a pretty lonely job. It's you. And early on, we hire uh, some consultants. These are professionals who run campaigns. And their job is to work out with you some kind of strategy, how you're going to go about it. You have some, a lot of data. The guys I worked with were really great number crunchers. So they knew a lot about the electorate and how people tend to vote and what kinds of things might appeal to them. So we devised a strategy for how we were going to go about it, included mostly knocking on doors and knocking on 15,000 of them, and, uh, and making lots of phone calls and raising money. Um, it turns out, and here's the next one, is that this is the second lesson, that the results of primaries matter a lot. A lot of people don't vote in primaries. That's a bad choice. I'll tell you what. Uh, in the primary, if I did not come in at at least 48% or higher, then the, the word was from the state party I ran as a Democrat. So the Democrats uh, wouldn't invest in my in my uh, race because their assumption is, well, gee, if you did do better than that in the primary, it's unlikely that you're going to win. And that's understandable. It's a rational decision because, like anyone else, they have limited amounts of money. They want to invest them in the races around their uh, county. There are, what, 49 counties in Washington, I think? I think that's right. Uh, you want to invest where you have a chance to win. So that meant that any money that I was going to raise would not come to the state instead of having around $300,000, which would include mostly money from those organizations. It would only be money that I could raise. So I was able to raise on my own about $70,000, which is not a bad number, but not nearly enough to really be very competitive. So the results of primaries matter a lot. So when you're tempted next time not to vote, please do, because your candidates, it's a big deal. And I attended a, um, a little event yesterday for Addison Richards running for the, the state house. And uh, you know, I'd asked him, I said, have you done any polling? You know how you're doing? And we can't afford polling. Is that something the state does? He said, well, the best polling we got was the primary. Now he won the primary by 113 votes. Oh. Now, keep in mind that, that uh, Emily won her, her Senate seat by less than 100 votes in the general. So primaries matter a lot, and they, they make a lot of difference for what follows. Um, the third thing that I learned is that being personally involved in politics, whether you're running or not, really matters. <laughs> There are a stunning number of people in this country who choose neither to register or to register to vote. And so when we're out campaigning, we don't even bother to knock on those doors because there's no point. They're not registered to vote anyway. And yet non-registered voters have a big impact on elections. Their absence matters. <laughs> That's the point I'm trying to make. So being personally involved in politics Really matters. You hear oftentimes people saying, Well, I hate politics. So my wife says, I hate politics, don't want to be involved. I understand it. You know, it's it's a dirty business. It is. Um, and there's no shying away from that. But you know what? Life is boring. This morning's story about uh, Jacob going, being nervous about going to meet his brother, it's politics. <laughs> so being involved in politics matters. The third thing. Fourth thing I met that I Realize, and I knew this before I started, that policies, our laws, have an enormous impact on us. You know, which laws we pass and which ones fail make a huge difference in the lives of people in this country, in the state, in our county, in our district. They really do matter. So who we elect, of course, makes a difference because they're the ones that put those laws into effect. You know that, but boy, my, my uh, campaign reinforced that for me. And finally, who we vote into office obviously really does matter. I sometimes hear from uh, some people, even like I was out doing some doorbelling for one of the candidates just a few weeks ago. I did some this week, I'll do a little bit tomorrow. Uh, and I got into a conversation with a guy who was really quite um, cynical. And you know, there's a lot of cynicism that's expressed, and one of them is, you know what, it comes down to there's no difference between the parties, doesn't matter who we elect. That's, excuse me, the word baloney. It's just not true. It matters a lot. 
And I think we're all pretty much aware of that. So those are five quick ones. There's probably more lessons, but about five's enough. <laughs> Get you started. Give you a little bit of, of uh, reason why they ask me to lead this conversation because I have a little bit of time in the game. Uh, so state and national candidates, these are the ones that are coming up, you know who they are, but just quickly, we've got for U.S. Senate, uh, Senator Murray, who's the incumbent, uh, you know her story, she's been there a long time, a senior member of the delegation there, running against Smiley, who's the Republican. In the House, we have Derek Kilmer, who has been an incumbent now for maybe three or four terms in the, in the Congress. Before that, he was a state senator, before that, he was a representative for the 26th District. He's running against Chrysler Meyer. I think he has faced her before. Maybe because I've seen her name before. Uh, might have been against him. I'm not sure. She's a Republican. Uh, for Secretary of State, we had inserted because our Secretary left for a job in the federal government, uh, Hobbs, who is a Democrat. And traditionally, believe it or not, in this state, we've had nothing but Republicans in that seat for a long, long time. So a Democrat there is unusual. He's, he's running against uh, Anderson, who is a, a, an independent, calls herself an independent, doesn't claim uh, either of the other parties. Uh, for state Senate, we have Randall, who's a Democrat. She served one term, so she's looking for a second term. And she's being uh, opposed by Jesse Young, who has served in the House over four terms, running as a Republican in that race. Uh, for state representative position one, it's, it's uh, Richards, that's Addison Richards, who I been doing a little bit of work for uh, versus uh, Spencer Hutchins. Spencer is a guy I know well. You probably know him too. Anybody know Spencer? Yeah, Spencer is uh, like like uh, Addison, a, a local boy. Uh, and, uh, both of them are attorneys. Uh, he's happens. Spencer's in the real estate business. Um, Addison is an attorney working for people who can't afford attorneys. Uh, social justice is kind of his thing. Well, they're running against each other. That's so there's no incumbent in that race because that was Jesse's seat. And then the seat that I ran for previously called here. And if you notice, I haven't seen a single sign of hers. Have you? Oh, you have? Yeah. But she's got a few out. Yeah. I've seen almost none. And what that indicates is that she feels he doesn't have to uh, because her, her opponent, Macklin, uh, was, had a very low number of votes in the primary. And she's probably right. But I hope not. That's just an opinion. Okay, so let's talk about what factors influence your vote. And there are a bunch of them. And this is where I want to engage in some conversation. First of all, um, obviously, are the issues. So I'm just going to open it up to the floor. Are there particular issues? And these shift from time to time. But today, if we were voting today, and we're going to vote in 23 days. Uh, but if you're voting today, well, that's the that's the day people, most of them are going to vote before that because everything is by mail in this state. So nobody votes that late. But that's the deadline. <laughs> it's 23 days from now. So are there are particular issues this year. And I, let's stick to just the 26th district and what we're talking about here, including our, our senator, I mean, our congressman, that's, and our senator, our, that's, those are national. What issues are really top of mind for you? As you make decisions about any candidate, what what are the big people? What issues? Yes, sir. Reproductive freedom. Reproductive freedom. Okay, I'll repeat those so we don't have to, have to pass them around. Okay. What else? Pro environment. Uh, being pro environment, being aware of environmental issues. What other issues? Inflation. Inflation is an issue. Climate change. Pardon? Climate change. Climate change. As an issue, others truth telling, <laughs> truth telling. Oh, there, there's an issue. Oh. <laughs> yes. You're talking about the, the conniver, the Jacob. <laughs> that, that implies the guy didn't always tell the truth. In fact, he didn't. So we know that for a fact. Yeah, so truth telling. Other issues? Yes. Ever increasing taxes. Ever increasing taxes. So taxes are an issue. Now, those are plenty of issues. So, yes. Military leadership. Oh, military leadership. So, all right. What's our our, our elected position? Taiwan, Korea. Yeah. So, all of those kinds of issues, and I'm sure you're aware of this, as you read, for example, you brought your voters pamphlet with you, and you open to any of the statements 
by any of the candidates. You'll notice that there is whether they, you're well, whether you're aware. I'm sure you're aware. There's coded language in all of those statements, and I can tell you as for writing one of those, it's done that way on purpose. So what do I mean when I say coded language when you're writing about issues? What am I talking about? I think the brown lines. Yeah. But what? What between them? Who's the coded language for? It's generic code. Actually, it's not. Uh, Most of the coded language is for your base. So if you watch for it in just about any kind of political uh, communication, there are certain words and phrases that are used that if you are on one side of the aisle or the other, might not even register for you. But if you're on the other side of the aisle, you resonate immediately. And political consultants, particularly, and candidates are very aware of that. So when you're reading those statements, look for those coded statements. And if you can, if you tend to vote Democrat, try to think about what are the code words for the Republicans. If you tend to vote Republican, what are the code words for the, de for the Democrats, and so on. And try to read between the lines of exactly what it is that they're saying. Randy, can you give us an example? Well, I don't know. Pick one out. Let's open up a voter's guide. Um, let's take Kilmer. Yep, I've got him. He's up, that's on page 18 and 19. Um, okay, so his opening, opening paragraph. I'm proud to be recognized as one of the representatives of Congress most committed to bringing people together. That's a code. Wants to be bipartisan. Okay. Even working with people with whom I disagree. But too many people in our area are suffering because Mitch McConnell and the Donald Trump believes blocking progress may help them win elections. Now, that's not coded at all. <laughs> nice. I could go on, but it kind of gets my point. So here's, here's Pricelmeyer, who's running against it. It's, it's uh, Elizabeth Pricelmeyer. Um, and she says, My candidacy isn't about me. It's about America, Americans, Washington, and Washingtonians, people like you and me who live here and love it here. So far, it sounds pretty innocuous. Most of us sense America's headed the wrong direction. Ah, there's a code, meaning whoever's in office in this case, Silmer. Uh, crime and homelessness are surging, code words. Public safety threatened, that's the same message. Uh, businesses are suffering, more code words. And inflation, the highest in four years, well, we all know that, but you know, who's to blame for that? Well, that would be the party in power. Uh, well, you, you get my point, right? So as you read those things, <laughs> read with an understanding that they're writing them for a particular audience. And sometimes you try to write them broadly enough that you can particularly go after that elusive group, swing voters. Now, I have a hard time believing this is my personal opinion that there really are any swing voters, but there are people who will go back and forth. They will swing back and forth. It's an increasingly small number. Around 46% of, of uh, people in this district tend to vote Republican. Around 48% tend to vote Republican. Republicans 48, Democrats 46. Wow. That's about where it is right now. In general. So the rest are up, up for grabs. Also, candidate experience and qualifications. How much does that matter? And I'm not just talking about political experience, any kind of experience. What's, how much of that matters to you? A lot, a lot, a lot. A lot. Okay, could you give me an example? What, what would matter? What kind of experience or qualifications? Yep. Knowing the general laws about ethical or, or right conduct in a political job. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of nice when you hear from a candidate, they actually seem to understand how government works. Yes. It's not always <laughs> true. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, that one matters to me. What other experience and qualifications matter? Knowing everybody is very personal. Yeah, okay, so personal connections. Politics is very personal. It really is about connections, who you know, and whether they trust you or not, whether they're willing to go along with you or not. Back in the days when politics was a little more uh, back and forth, a little more collegial. Um, hey, I'll give you this for that. A lot less of that going on now, but who you knew and who were your friends were really, really mattered a lot. I think it still matters. So I see why it's a, a, an important factor 
but it's not uh, definitive or decisive for me. Uh, it, you might be a case in point, and you didn't come with a bunch of, of, of uh, labels about you know, being in politics. So it would be no. like, what's the character? That's important. What kind of character does this person have? And it, it just, to me, if you have a good character, it, it, you don't have to be extremely smart to learn how to work in the system, you know, how, how to write a bill, to help write a bill, and so on and so forth. But your character really matters. I think so too. I agree with you. <laughs> So again, there's a lot more, but we could go on with much more. So qualifications, at least the main experience, not necessarily political. Matt, we want some people who have shown that they can get things done somewhere in their work, in their volunteer work, whatever they happen to be doing, that matters to me. Party, how much does party matter to you? A lot, a little. Well, right more now, so a lot. Now. Yeah. 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 Would it be fair to say that it matters more now than it might have Years ago, yes. yeah, and I would say in the past I would cross from one side or the other to vote for different. I still do occasionally, but not very often anymore. Uh, so yeah, party does matter a lot, and so there, people kind of tend to carry that banner, and we know because we read and are informed that that also has some downsides uh, that are pretty obvious. Uh, incumbency, how much does incumbency matter? I mean, if you vote for the incumbent, usually the incumbent, if you've been there a while, has accumulated some power because that's how the system works. If you're in the legislature or the Congress, the longer you're there, the more senior position you have, the more power that you have. So as a voter, does it matter to you? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. It also matters in a negative way somehow. The incumbents, you can figure, they have become, in some sense, many of them in Congress and the U.S. office become more distrustful because they are not responsive to what happens. Right, so an incumbent may be less responsive because maybe they have more power, they don't have to pay as much attention. Um, yeah, that's that's a valid point. Yeah. Well, I think that an incumbent, it's more important that we actually look to see what have they done, what have they stood for, what have they accomplished? You know, are they actually, are they serving us well? Um, right. As opposed to maybe somebody without the experience you just look what if they accomplished in other arenas but you also i'm sure are aware uh that because an awful lot of voters people who actually do vote are extremely uh, uninformed and, and they have, they've done nothing to inform themselves about candidates and issues so when they open up that voting pamphlet or you know for us to get the thing that you fill out at home and drop it in the envelope They'll gravitate to a little work names that they recognize. And of course, the ones they're most likely to recognize are incumbents because they've been there before. So that's part of it. So we come and see, yes. Randy, I'm just I want to go back to the party here. Sure, go ahead. I think that the parties have required somehow for a candidate to be more to more uh, or to adhere to a party line more closely. You think about the days when there was Strom Thurmond and Joe Biden in the same party, right? Stuff like that doesn't happen anymore. It, it, not it, as much. Not much. And, and how, how has that happened? Have you got any thoughts on that? Or why has that happened? And it's pretty hard for you to be pro life or to be uh, anti abortion and be a Democrat pretty hard. You might be able to do it somewhere, but it's hard. Increasingly difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I have I mean, a lot that's of, just an example. I, I have a lot of thoughts on that, but I prefer to hear yours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think it's possible to be personally anti-abortion. Personally, if it were up to me in my house, kind of, you know, but then yeah, it would be difficult to be uh, a Democrat and, and be then anti-abortion for actually everyone else. My personal opinion about abortion is that it's bad public policy. It's bad health policy. So whether I like abortion or not is sort of irrelevant. It's just, it, in my opinion, doesn't work very well as public policy as health policy. So for that reason, whether it was Republican or Democrat, that's where I would fall. But if you disagree with me, I don't have any problem with that. Oh, that's another issue, sure. which can be very partisan. 
this climate change environment. Yes. I, I don't know too many Republicans that, that might be a few who do believe in climate change and who are strong pro-environment advocates. Right. But there, you know, used, there used to be a lot of them. Yes, I know. Well, I'm thinking of Teddy Roosevelt, sure. uh, Tim Eisenhower, yeah. you know, yeah. all the, 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 the national parks that they created. And now it's now it's become a litmus test that if you're pro-environment, then you can't be in a Republican Party. Which is, it seems to be. Yeah. yeah, it seems to be. It's, it's, it's difficult. Lots more to cover, so let's, let's keep going. Um, sources of financial support. Do you think about that at all? You know, yes. <laughs> Are you aware of where you can find that stuff? No, no. You know, actually, online. <laughs> online, yeah, you can actually go to the uh, Secretary of State site, and if you Google this, you can find exactly there's a list by name and the amount of money of every person that's given money to a candidate. So if you're curious about who's supporting that candidate, it's not a secret. Unlike no. unlike Congress, some places or you know, where there's a lot of dark money. Supporting candidates must be public. And it's so does, does that include the so-called nonprofits that basically just channel money from well, dark sources to? <laughs> well, now that's different. So on awful, let's, this jumps ahead to what I was going to talk about, the stuff you get in the mail, and some of the political ads you see on TV or air on radio, a lot of it's negative stuff. And unless you see a candidate at the end say, I endorse this or I approve this message, they probably their, their campaign probably did not put that out. So there are a lot of uh, well, they're not controlled. There are a lot of entities out there that can put out anything you want without limit and say anything they like about it for or against other candidates. So an awful lot of that negative stuff you see about any candidate is funded by these outside groups that are not controlled. Part of it has to be listed on the advertisement, though, so you'll see here the top five people that have invested money or organizations right. that have invested money into producing that ad work. It's on there. And it also uh, oftentimes has to refer to specific um, laws, policy that's out there that they're claiming something yay or nay for Washington, you can look them up. Washington State's better at it. Uh, at the national level, it's not good at all. Uh, it's, it's really, it's dark, dark money. Mm -hmm. but yeah, so it, it's there. Also, most of these groups have very innocuous sounding names and you know, completely against whatever yeah. they call themselves. For me, the financial support and sometimes people, it's also helpful when you're looking at ballot measures. We sort of read, it's like, Who's behind this? Right. Who, who gets something out of it? You know, who gets to win some money or whatever? Yeah, for example, uh, the oil companies were supporting one of the candidates in the district uh, with a lot of money. I won't say who it is, but I just know that because I looked it up. Anyway, source of financial support, they matter to me. I pay attention to it. If I'm really, you know, if it's kind of gray to me, I don't understand what it is. I'm, that's one of the places I'll look. So, okay, who's behind this? And go, ah, no. <laughs> or, ah, this is a good idea. So when you look these up, does it actually, I mean, isn't it sometimes just the name of a pack or some group that yes. does not that's, mean? How do you know who the billionaire behind it is? You don't. Mm -hmm. You don't. You'd have, Although, look, you'd have to look up that fact and see what did you can find right. any information on who's involved. And as George pointed out, in Washington, those pieces now, that, didn't, that wasn't the case when I ran, now have to list the top five donors at least. So we at least have that much transparency about sources of funding for those pieces. But if you're like me, most of the time I don't get to that party because of the recycle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, what about corporations? Like, my wife doesn't want me to shop at Home Depot anymore. Uh, it lists it lists business yeah. names when you look up the amount that's supported. Yeah, well, also expense, supporting expenses. To yeah, they're tell you where they're spending that money. Like you, there are a growing number of national corporations I will no longer shop and have for a long time. And the, the list gets longer, <laughs> which sort of limits your choice. Of <laughs> you know, am I really going to continue the business with Amazon? 
Trust in the elections. How much is that in, in that? There's, there's one side of the aisle that's really, that's their main thing, is you can't trust elections. I think it works well in Washington with our mail-in, and I don't believe that there's been a lot of issues here. The baby says like 0. 0.000 something yeah. percent. But uh, it amazes me all of the people who still say that Biden was not really elected. I don't know if they can take you to say that. There's a there is a ton written on. I subscribe to the New York Times Washington Post and a number of other publications, and I'm always reading through this stuff. It's like there's so much ink on this stuff, exploring the answer to that question. And the answer is it's ridiculous, of course, but for political reasons, they continue to put it forward. Our Secretary of State, yeah. yes, right. yeah. And so I, I took that as a, you know, that the system was in pretty good shape and that they put their expertise to a yes. national level. Yes, that's true. Yeah, yeah. so that's that's kind of a compliment. I mean, you talked to Gerald Dobson's family, they do a lot in Kitsap County, and the, it's very complicated how fussy you have to be about all that stuff. I you do, and you know, if you're involved in that kind of stuff in this state, uh, they're very exacting about it. And, you know, when back in the days when we had polling places, they were pretty careful about that stuff too. Now, I don't, do we even have polling places? No. Yeah, so yeah. I think it's, it's all it's all it's like Dropbox. Dropbox or well, no, no, you can still go <laughs> to the Pierce County headquarters yeah. and drop. Yeah. Yeah, but that's still a Dropbox thing, right? <laughs> no, I think you can actually. We can go there and physically vote there. Okay, it's a very few. Pierce County, I don't think, does that. Yeah. When I retired, I worked for Pierce County elections during elections as a part time job. And I was there for 12 years. And no, brother. what we had to do to get your ballots out to you and get them back and make sure the system they go through to make sure a signature is correct. It's a long, complicated process. Yeah. Because you have, you know, you have, when it's up and running, you have members of both Democrats <coughs> and Republicans in there at all times, and they can talk to anyone they want and look at anything they want. Yes, I was just thinking, this is my sense of humor, that uh, Sarah Palin may not like the right voting system in Alaska. No, <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work very well for her. And I can riff on that, but let's keep going. <laughs> yeah. How about this one? Uh, being a person of faith, not how much does that impact that. on your vote? I'm too cynical about that. No. So. Well, I'm suspicious. I'm suspicious <laughs> if they're flag wavers, if they're fundamentalist Christian, I immediately, and it's just, it makes me feel. So guilty because a long time ago that was really important to me. But now I'm looking at core values, I'm looking at education, I'm looking at where they got their education. Um, as soon as they say I'm a, a born again Christian, my antenna are up and I am ready to be I, I get that. But my question is for you personally, being I'm going to assume you're all persons of faith, right? I would always probably wouldn't be here this morning. So just being a person of faith, does that have an impact on the way that you vote? Yes. yes. You yes. label yourself. It does. Right. Right. Yeah. It, 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 it can be negative. If they're, if they're pondering, counting all over how much of a person of faith they are, I think. Uh, yeah, public yeah. pronouncements of person of faith. Yeah, yeah that, like Lori kind of concerned me. However, I also will note, I don't know if you've done this, but when you get a prompt from one of the organizations that we support and you know I say please write your congressman about whatever issue and I don't do it a lot but I do some 
And almost all of them, if they come from like the LCA or some other organization, the opening sentences has a person of faith. So we're drawing a line and saying, I know that those people claim to be a person of faith, but as a person of faith, here's where I stand. And it isn't that stuff you've been hearing in public. So I, I do use that term. I don't block that one out when I send my email or my letter. So I still use it. As a person who was a Republican for 36 years, I don't know if that was a question. <laughs> the difference I'm finding <laughs> is that being with this congregation and this <coughs> denomination, I've had to, well, I've chosen to learn to be a more responsible voter because it just got too crazy. And what we usually did is we would have a meeting like this where whoever was the one person that we knew would do the research, whatever they said, we did. And we wow. didn't do our own homework. We weren't taught to do our own homework. And that poor person, as the years went by, began to shut up more and more because they were a lawyer. And they knew how to do the research, but they didn't want to take the time to teach all of that. Or the responsibility. Because we weren't very teachable. <laughs> and so this particular election, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how I need to be more diligent about doing my homework and, why, and very aware of why I changed. And this has disappointed many of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Just a historical perspective that. Um, what was it? Luther said something about he'd rather be fooled by a wise chirp than a foolish creek. Yeah. You know, so it's been a long time since the early days of the church that the faith has been taken over, has been perverted. What, we, what did we read in Timothy today about the people that itching ears and all this kind of stuff? And that did that did catch my ear. Right? Yeah, yeah, and, and so it starts messing with the faith. It happens right away. And, 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 uh, at the beginning of, of uh, Constantine's reign, uh, you could not be a Christian and be in the army. But at the, because he, Christians uh, were, had their own, their allegiance to Jesus as Lord, and you, and you had to be in the army, you had to proclaim Constantine as Lord. But then within less than 100 years, only Christians were in the army. Wow. Yeah. So, so they dramatically changed the notion of following Jesus. Yeah, amazing. There were other factors, of course, but I thought that was a pretty good proof. I also want to talk about which of these campaign materials you find useful. There's, I've got a few of these, so let's talk about that. First one is the voter's guide. So we got the state voter's guide, uh, each of the counties, I've got Kitsap County, you probably just got Pierce counties, right? Yeah. 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 So we've got our own elections with the county. So besides the 26th district, we've got, you know, so elections. One of the things that's confusing about elections is the, the boundaries are different for everything. Yeah. You know, so you've got a congressional district. Well, that's pretty big, and that goes across several areas. So like Kilmer and, and Murray, um, that's one for all of them, is that statewide? But Kilmer is in the 8th district. Right. Seven. 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 And in the, in the House and Senate here, it's the 26th legislative district. And then, of course, you got Sears County, you got Kids County, and so on and so on. So, voters, got, do you find them useful? Do you refer to them? Do you read them? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, as someone who's only lived in Washington for a little over a year, and you should have to go to the polls and try and remember the names when you finally got the ballot to be able to sit down ahead of time. And number one, figure out what the heck district you belong to, and then pull down the corner of the page so you'll so you'll be able to go back there. And then you could just sit at the table, reread um, what's there, and then decide your vote. Uh, to me, that's the biggest thing: mail-in voting. It helps, it helps you do that homework. Um, and it gives you that time ahead to think through, um, you know, what you're reading and, and that kind of thing. So these have become really uh, important to us since we've lived in, in Washington. Um, as we got to know names, you know, like I just heard Kilmer's name 
in these last few months. It took me a while to realize, oh yeah, oh, you know, we so knew her Amy because she was our senator uh, in you know, Spokane and stuff too, was good for them too. But um, I think they're very useful to be a more informed voter. Well, and I need them for, for the, the issues and candidates where I really don't know much. For example, we got two advisory votes this month. Yeah. Advisory votes, votes have only been around a little while, I think. I'm not sure when these things started, but these are bills that were passed by our state legislature. But then they, they come to us and ask for our advice about whether it's okay, but we're not actually deciding. I find this all very yeah. confusing. Yeah. So, yeah. so I don't think they have to abide by this, but they pay attention. Anyway, so there are two uh, this time. One of them is that they had increased the tax on aircraft fuel from it. 11 cents a gallon to 18 cents a gallon. So that's going to cost $14 billion, million dollars in the first 10 years for government spending. We think that's a good idea or not, so we have it. We can we can give our advice with our vote. Um, and without reading about this, I wouldn't have any idea what that's about. I, and actually, you can read this, I don't know why. So I'm going to have to do a little bit more. Second one is in gross substitute house bills, uh, 27, 2076. And this one in this in the uh, description, I, I finally figured out. Oh, okay. So this is for uh, LNI premiums to drivers of what is this? Oh, Transportation network. So I'm guessing taxis. Ubers. Oh, Uber Lyft. Okay, so there you go. So they want to fund this stuff with a fifteen cents. Yeah, 15 cents per, per passenger per trip. Right. Yeah. So it's like at first blush, that seems reasonable, but I, you know, I need to look at that a little more closely. So at least I have some idea of what the heck is that because the description doesn't tell me anything yeah. until I get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty. They used to have links at the bottom for more information. They probably do. I look back for you. So that's one where I, I tend to go because it also, I not sure exactly what this means, you know. So I tend to go to the list of all the uh, people in the House and the Senate of the state. And I know a number of these folks, I know the ones who are very, very conservative, right? Because I used to live in Colfax. Right? <laughs> I know those guys. I know that area of well, the I mean, I know them personally, and then I know some folks around here, including our own uh, state senate. So, and I say, well, how do they vote? And then I tend to trust for I, I I do that's one of the things I as I look, you can see who voted for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean it does tell you the number of votes at the bottom, but you can dig a little deeper and try out. It will, it will tell you confirming to the broker. It will tell yeah, you how right. they voted. Yeah, yeah. Tell them all oh, there it is. It's on the next page. Yeah. So the advisory votes are there. Yeah. Well, really, one of the things when I read the thing about the gas tax pool, I wonder how do we compare to other states? You know, does that make a burden more so in a different Oregon, and how does that play out? Does that mean when they queue up here, they have to pay extra? Right. Does that would that mean they queue up someplace else if you were out of line um, with other states? So I, I don't. I don't and I don't and know also, that. I'm always curious. Well, what, what problem are we trying to solve? Yeah. You know, yeah. So <laughs> I mean, that's going to raise that's going to raise some money, but you know, for what? What are we What are we trying to do here? Yeah. Are we going to be like saving yeah. everybody yeah. or? So the consensus is use a voter's guide. They're a really good first step. Probably not enough, but boy, it, it's enormously helpful compared to not having that information. Yes. And also the first county progressive voters kind of online, which it looks progressive, right? But it doesn't explain their reasoning. Uh, you might say. Yep. Uh, more than one county, Pierce County has one. Kids have those two so progressive and conservative voters guides to give you kind of their here what you think about that. It's kind of like reading Luther's explanation of the <laughs> commandments. You know, here's what this means. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> How about this? Candidate interviews in the newspaper in the in the Kitsap Sun. I live in Kitsap County. Uh, paper is very diligent about having interviews with all the major candidates for the local area. 
and they'll give them, they'll ask them a series of questions. When I was a candidate, I sat down with the, the board uh, at the, the Kids Have Sun, and I went over to the News Tribune and did the same thing. They published them, and sometimes the next one, there'll be an editorial endorsement of one of the other candidates. How much do those, you read them? Do they mean anything to you? Do they influence your vote? Either the interviews or the endorsements? If there isn't an endorsement, that isn't anything. If those questions aren't answered, then I can't. I have no interest in that change. Okay. So, yeah, so if they're asking questions and they're dancing around and not answering. Well, they didn't even, didn't even bother to respond. That, that makes a difference to me. It does. I, 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 I used to uh, put a little bit more weight into but now newspapers are. Is to call that way along with it. They're not owned by uh, people in our area, and all they care about is profit. Seriously, you know, they, they, who, who's going to continue the system working for them? That's about all they care about, so I don't really trust them anymore. Yeah, you know, um, I remember growing up studying the period of yellow journalism. Remember that one? Okay. Well, journalism has always been yellow, okay? Still is. Okay. You have to keep in mind that. Every everything that's published has some point of view. I don't know how anybody can claim that they don't have a point, right? That's ridiculous. So I take that into account as well. I'll hope you do too. How about letters to the editor? There are lots of people. <laughs> 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 yeah. I don't know if anybody here sees the logo of the paper, but it's online. This is an online newspaper. It started about a year ago, nonprofit. essentially of print newspapers. Uh, I'm not subscribed to the local papers at all. Mm -hmm. So I don't see these interviews, in, even if they have them. I, I am subscribed to a couple of uh, national newspapers online, and that's it. Yeah, I, I have a couple of national, and then I, I subscribe to Kids Up Sun on, online. So I see the print version, but I don't take the print version. Same thing with uh, Seattle Times, I do that as well, but you may not, so they not, may not be there. But I'm kind of getting the people shaking their heads, you don't pay much attention to the letter to the editor. Like, unless it's somebody that, oh, I know so and so, and that's all right, that influences me. How about the political flyers that arrive in your mailbox? Recycling. Recycling. When I see a really nice piece by a candidate I like, I go, oh, that's a really nice piece. Let's go go to the recycle. Yeah. I'm not going to change my mind about it. Uh, and an awful lot of the stuff is negative. Mm -hmm. Why is so much of a negative? People respond. Yeah. Short answer is because it works. Yeah. Unfortunately, it works. Um, political ads in or on media. So television, radio, ads. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> break for the ads. <laughs> How about do any of you attend political forums? This is in person, you get a chance to hear. It might usually around here, it's not debates, it's some kind of uh, formalized questions. Each candidate gets two minutes, the other one is that kind of thing. I did a bunch of those. Did you attend any of those? Do they matter to you? We need more. Uh, yeah. We need more. Probably. I can tell you what my my uh, campaign uh, consultant said. It's like you have to do these because you're invited. You're not showing up. It's not good form, and they have absolutely no impact on the outcome. Of the <laughs> <laughs> They're a complete waste of time for the candidate. 
because pretty much everyone who attends that are there to root for one or the other candidates. So you change no one's minds. The only the positive thing is that there might be some decent reporting about what occurred at that. Or now, a lot of the stuff is available online, although most of it's edited. So like the some nonsense that went half that happened on a recent thing, they cut out all the garbage. So, and, but that garbage matters because it impacts the way people respond. And the kind of political form that I thought worked quite well, because it depends, that's some candidate, depends on who's running the form, was uh, in Anchorage, we worked our congregation as part of Anchorage Faith and Action congregations together. So it was, um, uh, community organizing stuff so that we knew the issues because we were in the community, you know, we were talking to people, and then each congregation was taking on things, but also then we would host the forum. And so then we would come up with questions. That's what helped make the forum worthwhile. Yeah. So uh, it was uh, the people personally knowing, and then they, it, it was really kind of uh, dangerous for the candidates because they had. To know all this stuff with the people and what was, and, and you know, it wasn't uh, kind of mean or confrontative in that way, but it was just putting on, and then you had to answer a question. Yeah. You know, if, if someone started BSing, you know, the person who asked the question, would you stop? No, that's not a question. That's, not, that was, <laughs> that's an interesting point, but that doesn't answer a question. Yeah. yeah. Have we not done that here before? We hosted forums here for political candidates. Yeah, I think, yes. I think we well, had yeah. in the past. Yeah. So I'm, I'm running out of time. I got five minutes. So I got a few other questions. The League of Women Voters, though, is going to have two this week yeah. on um, area representation. Uh, if you want to know, have a link where I can send you the, the flyer for it. Just let me know. And they're, they're very good at setting them up. They're very fair. The questions are always even. They're not pointed. They're not, they're not slanted. Um, they're terrific. I, I really think highly of them. So how do you get involved in politics? Uh, I was going to say I'm a 40 year, 40 year plus member of League of Women Voters. Thank you. Um, and I do think that they're important, especially for primaries, because a lot of times in primaries, you don't need to know who these people are. I've been to, you know, like there are 10 people in the primary. And some of them are like black holes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's unfortunate that we couldn't find a, a way to make those kind of things more available, get people to attend. Well, I think we need to get TV involved. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run a quick list of um, 10 things. How can you get involved in politics? How do you get involved? And since we're running out of time, I can't do these point by point or we won't finish. Um, 10, 10 ways you can get involved. One is I vote, but without involvement or preparation. Second, I make sure that I'm an informed voter. I talk about candidates with friends or neighbors when they decide, no, that's the fraud. Uh, I put <laughs> political signs in my yard. I personally, I'm not saying these about me, I'm saying you. I, I, by the way, I, I do these things, but I personally endorse candidates in print. They ask for an endorsement, I say, sure, you put my name on that. So it might appear in an ad. I support candidate issues and issues with cash. I write the checks or Send my credit card. I post uh, support for candidates on social media. Can any of you do that? We'll be criticized for it. Um, I write letters to the editors. I haven't this time, but I've written a lot of that letters to the editor. They actually, you know, if people know who you are, it matters that you wrote that letter. I mean, most of the time when I'm reading letters to the editor, I know them so well, I know who these people are on either side of the aisle I know exactly who it is. Um, I attend political events. Do you have any of attend any kind of political event? Support a candidate or issues or a forum? Uh, or volunteer your time for candidates, doorbelling, uh, phoning, writing postcards, anything like that. So lots of ways to get involved in politics. It's very difficult for candidates to get people to do pretty much any of these things beyond vote. So if they're able to move even a few voters into some of the lower ones, that makes an enormous difference in the success of a candidacy. I'm just telling you as a former candidate, 
it makes a big difference. So closing thought, because we're about at the end of our time here, I really appreciate your time and attention. George, thank you for asking me, or you asked me, Edith, to start with, to lead this initially. I thought, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now <laughs> I have the skills I can do this. <laughs> so closing thought is if you do nothing else, Okay. Thanks so much.